explain the structure of this webinar, which will be in two parts. So first, Dr. Jean Conte and Dr. Yvonne Foley will be speaking for about 40 to 45 minutes. During this time, if you have any burning questions that you would like to ask them later, please type them at the chat box at the bottom right-hand corner of the screen. Um, and I will make sure I pose those questions to Yvonne and Jean at the end of the webinar. That said, you will always have time at the end of their presentation to think and write even more questions at the chat box, if you like. Uh, so this will be followed by the second part, which will be a question and answer session. Tomorrow, you will receive an email from us with a link uh, to access the video recording of this webinar and enough uh, from me now. It really gives me great pleasure to introduce Drs. Jean Conte and Yvonne Foley, who will be speaking to us about the findings from their report, Initial Teacher Education and English as an Additional Language. Uh, this report was co-authored with Dr. Charles Anderson and Jonathan Hancock of the University of Edinburgh, and it was co-funded by the Centre for Education uh, for Racial Equality at the University of Edinburgh, the Bell Foundation, and Unbound Philanthropy. So, let me tell you briefly about today's speakers. Dr. Yvonne Foley has worked as a teacher for many years in the field of English as an additional language in schools and universities in Taiwan and across the UK. She is currently head of the Institute of Education, Teaching and Leadership at Moray House School of Education, the University of Edinburgh. Her teaching and funded research projects focus on the role of teacher education in promoting social, cultural and linguistic, linguistic inclusion, and she has a particular interest in the ways in which critical approaches to literacy can be implemented in classroom practices to meet the language and literacy needs of pupils learning English as an additional language. Yvonne is a co-director of the Centre for Education for Racial Equality in Scotland and currently serves as an executive committee meeting, sorry, committee member of the National Association for Language Development in the Curriculum, known as NALDIC, which is the National Subject Association for English as an Additional Language in the UK. Dr. Jean Conti has worked in multilingual contexts for her whole career, first as a primary teacher and teacher educator in different countries and then as an academic at the Universities of York and Leeds University, where she took up a senior lectureship in 2007. She has a particular interest in the roles of language and culture in the processes of learning, particularly in multilingual settings, and has published many books, chapters, and articles about these issues, including The Multilingual Turn in Languages Education, published by Multilingual Matters in 2014, and Jean is a long-standing member of NALDIC and has been involved in several projects relating to research, researching EAL in teacher education and development. Enough of me. Over to you, Jean, if you can please turn on your camera and start speaking to us. Welcome. I'm very happy to be here. I'm actually in Northumberland um, on a very nice warm afternoon. Um, and I hope you can all um, see me and hear me. Um, I'm going to begin this presentation um, with giving you uh, a bit of background and um, something about uh, the context in which we were working. Um, so I'll move on. We all live in a multilingual world, and we argue that this fact has profound implications for education, schools, teachers, and their pupils. This stance was one of our starting points for the research, which was carried out in England. So I'm beginning this presentation with an overview of the language and educational context in England. Um, especially, um, I think, important since we have so many participants from around the world. The population of England is multilingual, and the pupils inhabiting our classrooms reflect the wide diversity of languages that are spoken and written. Britain has been a diverse society for hundreds of years, and recent demographic changes have been rapid, meaning that diversity can now be regarded as a permanent and everyday feature of our lives. Currently, over 20% of pupils in mainstream schools are bilingual or multilingual. English is an additional language, or EAL, as I'm going, we're going to call it, 
is an umbrella term that is used for a hugely diverse and heterogeneous group of pupils in our schools. The terms listed here have all been used at different times throughout the years in official policy documentation to describe the different bilingual, multilingual, and bilingual pupils who have been grouped under the category of PAL. As you can see, they encompass a wide range of personal and social experiences, language and, and uh, education backgrounds, cognitive strengths, and needs. But for some, such as the first group, EAL may not really be a helpful categorization, as the vast majority of pupils in this particular group are second or third generation British citizens, and English is often their most dominant language while they use other languages daily in purposes. Language diversity is represented and reflected in the linguistic landscapes that surround us in our city towns. All of the signs you can see here are from the same multilingual city in the north of England. And they represent the history of language diversity there. From the German church, shown on the left, that was established in the 19th century, the corner shop shown at the bottom right, which is recently under new management that displays a vast array of languages in its windows. This reflects how it is serving a community that can genuinely be described as super diverse. Yet, when we consider education policy in England, where super diverse contexts such as these are common, we can detect a strong historical trend towards, towards inclusion as a prevailing value. Policy constructions around language are predominantly, predominantly about making sure that every pupil meets the same goals, usually in the same ways and through the same routes. Multilingualism is frequently treated as an irrelevance in the mainstream system and as something which is best left to community and complementary systems. The national curriculum, which is the main statutory guidance for all schools, um, is, inclusion is given its own section in, in this document. It's clearly defined as a principle and as a key value. EAL learners are groups along with other pupils who are considered as needing help in order to be included such as pupils with special needs, those with behavioural problems, and so on. This said, the specific guidance for EAL learners, which is reproduced in its entirety on the slide that you can see, does include two important principles that provide distinctive and essential guidance for teachers. The first is that pupils need to know about the prior education experiences of their pupils. The second, that EAL learners need support in learning language across the whole curriculum, not just in the subject of English. Similarly, there are national standards laid out for teachers, which all qualified teachers in England are required to meet. There are eight of them in total, and these promote a strong message of inclusion about meeting the needs of pupils, rather perhaps and recognising and building on their distinctive strengths. Standard 5, which is the one you can see on the slide at the moment, is the one which directly refers to EAL learners. Teacher training in England has undergone huge changes recently, with a move away from university and college-based training to training carried out in schools. The government website, Get Into Teaching, provides information and contacts for those seeking to become qualified teachers. The two quotes I've put up on the slide, I suggest, show a clear bias towards school-based training. The visual image I've put there, also taken from the website, reflects the government's concern to recruit more teachers from ethnic minority backgrounds. The proportion is still very low. The range of routes from qualified to qualified teacher status and their providers is now very wide indeed and can be somewhat, somewhat confusing. 
They encompass a huge range of options among providers, uh, both schools, universities, and colleges, and include groups like academy trusts, which essentially are private companies that run schools and have great intrinsic power over their own decision-making and accountability. Parity of quality is an issue. Is an issue. Some providers setting their own assessment procedures and processes, though all are overseen by the national regulator, Ofsted. We tried to cover as many variations of as Okay. Um, I think Yvonne is going to carry on. Hello, everyone. Yvonne, can you see um, the video? Video on? My video is on? There we go. Can you see me? Yes. Welcome, Yvonne. Thank you. Um, so I'd just like to talk you through the main focus of the research. Um, um, this study reported on the initial findings and the insights and recommendations that emerged from the research project. And these were exploring not only student teachers' perceptions, but teacher educators in terms of the extent that they felt initial teacher education programs in England prepared um, teachers and beginning teachers to meet the language and literacy needs of pupils learning EAL. What we can see is that within our own context and across other countries, um, migration in our populations have shifted significantly. And this means this has been for very different reasons. Some, as you can see from these pictures on the slide, have come for business purposes or to relocate. Um, in terms of family or for different reasons, in terms of study or work. Others have come from Commonwealth countries where there was the promise of migration and the promise of belonging in the Windrush generation. You will also see that others came into the country and went through a period of movement because they were refugees. And Ai Weiwei's um, documentary shows the complexity of his, cap his camera captures the complexity of these people as they are caught up in what we might call a global tsunami and enforced migration. His um, documentary is very bleak and depressing and sometimes intensely sad. And some have tried to capture this in terms of how to stop it. Others have tried to consider how to write about it. Others have thought, how do we adapt to this change? How do we engage different practices around this shift in migration? And schools and teacher education have also adapted policies to address the shift and the change in student population. We've done that through policy. We've, we've attempted to do that through curriculum in different parts of the UK. We've looked at assessment change and practice in some countries. And we have asked ourselves, how do we address this change? And how do we take the good work that has already started and build on that? And really, that's a combined job across teacher education as, as we look at what this has, um, the change in landscape. You'll see here that also in the US context, um, there are different messages that are communicated through the discourses that we use. And context is important when we talk about language, when we talk about culture, or when we talk about literacies or teacher education. Context is important. And often these discourses shape the stories that we live by. They shape the language that we use. And we communicate that as a society in different ways. If you look at some situations, we communicate um, our feelings around things by erecting borders. And I'm not saying that borders are always a bad thing. Borders can be useful. They can protect us from danger. They can categorize things. Um, they can promise a sense of belonging. And yet, they can also keep things in their place. But sometimes, they can be a great source of pain. Um, and they draw lines between people. 
and they often, often limit us from our humanity. You'll see that in the U context, thing, things are not different, mobility being the key feature of contemporary life. There's often hostility towards difference. And teachers have talked about being perplexed by these various different diversities. And they've also talked about unconsciously um, creating or constructing borders pedagogically because they, they lack the understanding or the, the knowledge in terms of how to put um, access points for people to be able to understand the literacies and language that's being used in schools. So if we look at borders or the, what, the language that we use, they can often keep people out or they can bring people in. And Joe Lobianco talked about that in terms of weapons of mass assimilation where we have erected things or constructed things that um, only allow certain languages to be used or certain identities to be present. And so it does raise questions about the kinds of um, identities and languages that we make space for within our schools. So the key research questions that drove the study um, are outlined on this slide. And they look at the extent to which student teachers believe their ITE program prepared them to meet the language and literacy needs of pupils learning EAL. They also looked at um, the extent to which teacher educators believed that they were prepared to extend the knowledge base and skills of student teachers in a way that allowed them to meet those needs. And then we also looked at how the participants in the study evaluated the usefulness of the materials designed by the research team in collaboration with others, both with students and teacher educators, in order to equip students to, to meet those needs. And those were the key questions that framed the study. We also had a number of key theories that um, influenced the study and guided our own thinking. And we looked at those in terms of critical sociocultural approaches to literacy. And that not only gave recognition of um, the skills or a cognitive approach to literacy, but it also brought in uh, literacy being seen as a set of social practices and this allowed us to look at issues of power, issues of identity, um, issues surrounding literacies and what is perceived as a norm. Because when we look at language, power, and inclusion, um, there are different ways that languages are positioned, different ways that cultures are positioned. And we wanted to include that given the context in which teachers and pupils are living and working. We also wanted to reflect on the multilingual term because um, there are needs for the classrooms to reflect the realities of multilingual societies. And that was important to us because that allows difference to be expected and planned for. And this enabled us to take a wider view um, in terms of the theories that we included. You'll see from the research reach that we engaged in a questionnaire across different parts of England. And from the north of England down to the south and the southwest, we used the questionnaire for this. And the questionnaire initially um, was successful in terms of 182 participants. The second questionnaire um, maybe came at a, diff a difficult time for some students with exams um, because we showed it. We sent that out at um, different points. So the two online questionnaires were across nine initial teacher education sites in England, and the first at the midway point of their ITE program, and the second at the end. We also engaged in iterative interviews and focus groups over the course of a year. And that was really insightful, because we were able to um, liaise back and forth with the students and with teacher educators during the course of 12 months. And that gave us lots to think about um, as we looked at the two particular main institutions that were in different regions in England that we focused on. OK. You know. I hope you can hear me. And uh, we're coming. So back, back to Jean. And um, I'm going to talk now about uh, some of our findings and the themes that we're going to so the rest of it is organized into these four sections that you can see here. The first 
sections focus mainly on the findings, and the second two will move to a consideration of the resources that we concluded need to be developed. We'll discuss the main themes that emerge from the findings and then the outcomes in terms of how the research has helped us to understand better the kinds of resources needed for teacher education. At the beginning of the project, we didn't anticipate that perceptions and conceptualizations of EAL would be as important as they clearly turned out to be. They emerged strongly from the interviews and focus groups with both the student teachers and teacher educators, and so became a key theme. We came to realize that before we could fully consider resources for teacher education courses, we needed to understand better the perceptions, understandings, values, beliefs, um, and identities um, about around EAL and language more generally that the participants brought with them to either being a student teacher or a teacher educator. The strongest perception, perhaps, is reflected on first a quote from the perceptions um, that EAL is, is a very important aspect of teachers' expertise, but in many ways a problematic one. This marks a change um, which has taken place in recent years alongside the demographic changes in England and the growth, perhaps, in negative media response to them. There was the clear sense that was articulated many times that there was currently not enough support for newly qualified teachers and feelings of anxiety and pressure in relation to the demands of national assessment requirements and targets were very common. This clearly resonates with the inclusion values in the curriculum. Student teachers see it as difficult to ensure that all pupils reach the same The second part of the quote on the slide reveals a view of the role of theory in teaching. It seems to be seen somehow as separate from classroom practice, perhaps something done in universities, while the work of actual teaching goes on elsewhere. There are, of course, different and more helpful ways of understanding the role of theory in teaching, and these need to underpin and be considered in resources of teaching. The perception of EAL as something new and difficult was felt to apply not just to what happened on courses, but also in schools, as you can see in this quote here. We were not able to access teachers' views directly, but it came, it came through strongly in comments, both from student teachers and teacher educators, that teachers felt unprepared and even abandoned in some ways in addressing the needs of EAL learners, and that things were steadily getting worse. This clearly resonates with the contextual factors that Yvonne discussed, and that can contribute to a sense of hostility and even fear in relation to those perceived to be different from ourselves. These kinds of attitudes, I would argue, permeate the views expressed on this slide might sound quite shocking that the teacher responded to EAL learners in this way, but we need to remember that this is a partial view of the situation. This said, the teacher's words, as reported by the students, do reveal a strong sense of anxiety about working with EAL learners. Equally importantly, I would suggest, they reveal a lack of awareness about the ways that drama affords a vehicle for all children to learn. To develop confidence and greater understandings of language and its role in communication and expression. The last quote, which is coming up now, I hope, yeah. The last quote on perceptions is very thought provoking. It's from a student teacher who is reflecting on their personal knowledge and its relevance for their role as a teacher of pupils with diverse backgrounds. Again, Research strongly supports the perception voiced here that teachers who have common personal and social experiences with their pupils can better understand the factors that may enhance or impair their learning. And as the quote shows, this can be about more than empathy. The 
which is, of course, very important in itself. In the case of EAL, this, this commonality can be about the understandings of the bilingual and multilingual experience and the distinctive ways in which learners come to the cognitive task of transferring their skills and knowledge from their home language to English. This clearly has strong practical implications for teaching and learning. And again, it's an important theme for the resources and one that needs to be constructed to apply to all teachers, not just those who are themselves bilingual or multilingual. Back to Yvonne. So teachers also um, that we spoke to in the first questionnaire, they were open-ended questions that we could speak to them about. Um, and they felt that students on ITE should be exposed to a wider range of languages and cultures during their studies. And you can see from this quotation that they felt that they wanted to engage more with what was happening in society. Um, they wanted to look at better international links because they recognized there was an influence in terms of culture um, and also learning from other places um, so that the British context or the English context could see um, how to support teaching and learning in more diverse ways. They thought that their ITE programs could be a source to link with these contexts and also placing British student teachers abroad to get a, sen a stronger sense of EAL practice. Um, they had also spoken about ITE programs being able to celebrate and encourage uh, learning about EAL, and that would give them more opportunities to think about the theories uh, around EAL or bilingualism. And there was a, a talk about no, needing to know more strategies so that they could use them practically in the classroom. So there was very much a sense of them recognizing this link to society and the wider context as they thought about their ITE program. Others in the teacher educator group, which was an interesting um, conversation, they spoke about um, subjects like science where there's special terminologies or that the subject excel itself encodes language in a particular way. One of the things that helps them is that they thought would help them would be a basic knowledge of linguistics or understanding how language works in general, um, because they felt that that was missing from certain subject areas. And talking about uh, trainees and talking to trainees helped them to see that they didn't really even understand simple things about language and how language works. And so I think this was something that we took on board as we looked at the development of language and culture and how academic subjects were encoded in different language. The teacher educator interviews also highlighted the fact that um, the students also wanted to appreciate uh, linguistic features and that having an appreciation of a child's first language, as Jean has mentioned, or their home language, um, was going to be something that was a, a resource or something that which they can access and develop English. Um, because they re recognize that not all children develop English in the same ways and that different languages might impact on that. So we did see, um, in, we did hear and see interesting um, understandings of the fact that other languages and cultures would shape how English was engaged with. And this, this is a positive thing. Um, the teacher educators also thought that it might be mindful to note these differences in language and how this would impact on their spoken and written English as they were engaged in uh, translating or using different languages in order to learn English. You can see here with the different shaping of the courses, um, student teachers on the surveys that we sent out were very aware and conscious that it, language across the curriculum and aspects of language, learning literacy in a new language, were all areas that they thought were either essential or important and you can see from this graph that down at the bottom end are fairly important and not important. You, didn't, you don't have high percentages. So most of the teachers that we did survey saw that um, 
these aspects were important and they wanted to learn more about that and so we took that into consideration as we designed a lot of the resources for teacher educators because in designing resources for the teacher educators that will cascade down into the lessons with student teachers and their subject areas would be shaped differently. So back to Jean now. Thanks, Yvonne. Um, I'm now going to spend a few minutes um, showing you some of our thinking um, about what the research has taught us about developing resources for teacher education. Um, we are really hoping that we'll have some kind of practical outcome from this, which will actually benefit teacher educators and student teachers. Key message uh, to consider um, comes in this quote. Um, and it's about bringing theory and practice together. I, for one, am very familiar with the kind of bullet point advice uh, referred to here, which teacher educators often feel they have to resort to on overcrowded courses, where there's little opportunity to plan collaboratively and draw out the links between different topics and sessions. I'd suggest that this slide conveys some important messages for teacher education partnerships between schools and colleges and other HE providers, mainly that participants need to work together in planning um, and not work as separate units. I'm just moving on to the next one. is a comment from a teacher educator's interview, and I think it reveals a big frustration felt across teacher education courses in England, where the imperative need is often of what the student teacher will need to do on their next imminent school placement, rather than with what principles need to be considered in order to promote a longer term professional autonomy, which can support decision making and choice um, as, as students move into taking control of their classrooms. A perennial debate, debate in developing teacher education courses as a whole, and not just around EAL, is whether to develop self-contained comprehensive input which can simply be bolted together or to work towards permeation across courses. It's, it's our view that things can be said for and against either approach. Um, but perhaps more important is that whatever decisions are made about how to proceed, this is done in collaboration with all tutors and others involved in course planning and implementation. So to conclude this section, I'm showing you now the five key foci that we have taken from the findings to feed into the development of resources. I'm going to explain these in a bit of detail uh, because we believe that together they point to and underpin essential changes needed in thinking about course design and also about EAL and education more generally in developing research and practical approaches to EAL in both teacher education and school contexts. The first focus on perceptions and conceptualizations aims to inform teacher educators and student teachers about the historical formation of EAL in socio-political and language education policy contexts in England, in order to help make connections between teacher and pupil identities and to develop professionalism in the field of EAL. The second focus on how language works includes the contentious area of grammar. Teachers do not need to understand all the languages that their pupils bring to their classrooms. Indeed, this is impossible practically, especially in classrooms where more than 30 or 40 language, languages may be represented. These are increasingly common. But research shows how some understanding about how language works as a system can be useful professional and pedagogic knowledge. In many research studies, the decontextualized teaching of grammar has been shown to be ineffective in improving pupils' understanding and skills in reading and writing. 
The strategy that we advocate must go beyond simply naming the parts, moving towards understanding how grammar underpins meaning and communication, with approaches such as analysis and reflection on the effects of particular linguistic choices on texts. A second key strand in this focus is the analysis of key similarities and differences between languages, which John has just mentioned, and of the active problem-solving pattern-detecting work that pupils coming from different language systems need to do to puzzle their way through communicating English, which mirrors the kind of work that English speakers will do in developing skills in literacy and in learning other languages. The third focus aims to look at how academic language encodes different subject areas based on a functional model of language, which has the potential to develop teacher educators' awareness of the academic language that expect pupils in schools to be able to read and write, including for assessment and attainment purposes. The fourth focus involves analysing a wide range of texts, thinking about how they make meaning, convey messages and biases, how they persuade, promote agreement, and provoke disagreement, all through the tool of language. The aim is to develop critical thinking skills in both student educators and student teachers, as well as equipping, equipping student teachers with approaches to developing the same kind of critical skills with their pupils at different stages of the process. The fifth focus here applies to all the earlier four and is about using a transformative lens to design all the resources. The key aim is to promote a new approach to course design and implementation for teacher educators that promotes their empowerment and does the same for teacher educators teachers. We hope the resources that we develop will support teacher educators in finding ways to use new understandings, knowledge and skills about EAL across their existing courses. For us to take those ahead and in terms of how we framed those and what framed our thinking, we took what student teachers and teacher educators talked to us about, but we also had gone to the literature as we had mentioned in order to take us ahead of where we are in our thinking. And we wanted to draw on Levine and Howard in 2014 because they can be implemented, um, their principles and values can be implemented across the development of different programs. And what was important in this framework was that you're not only seeing what you're doing now and being able to enhance that or take that forward, but you're also seeing what is possible and what is desirable. You have a vision for the future. And that was important for us to see a vision of the possible. Within that framework, you also were looking at teachers not only having a deep understanding of their content knowledge or their subject area, but they were also looking at how their practices could be enhanced or they would be able to develop a, a more diverse repertoire to meet the needs of multilingual classrooms. And so we were looking at that in terms of their pedagogy, their literacy practices, and how that would start with difference. Um, we have the norm that is often set up as Western uh, literacy practices um, in terms of our pedagogies, but we had considered how we might reframe that where difference is the core and that that's the starting point for any planning or practices that engage with literacy development. We also looked at um, the importance of dispositions, and that's because the, the dispositions that we, that we have or that we share or that we embody, engage with, those are important and they, 
they frame the choices and they underpin the choices that we make in the classroom. And so if we go back to those slides of the pictures that we showed you with the discourses that are operating in society, um, teachers are living and working in those, um, amongst those discourses. And so we felt looking at um, issues in terms of uh, gender and race and equality, all of those things that needed to be considered as teachers engaged with their development in being a new teacher. We also looked at um, some of the key rec insights and recommendations that came through from the data. And some of these we'd just like to uh, speak to you about in terms of an integrated career long approach to teacher education. Um, because while that is needed, we didn't see it just um, being a part of initial teacher education, but it went right across the span of teacher education from pre-service um, teachers to in-service teachers through to higher education and working together in order to find um, ways of enhancing each other's practice, ways of taking each other's practice is something that needed to be considered and that would be something that could be a national approach. Um, as I spoke to you about before in terms of moving the margins to the center, often EAL is positioned in the margins. You're often asked, um, as Jean and I have been, to, be, to make guest appearances on ITE programs. And we thought that moving EAL from the margins to the center would enable all teachers to draw on translanguaging and practices and also have a transcultural lens as the new norm for how they shape and design and practice their, their own literacy events. In that way, teachers would be responsive to difference in terms of race, in class, and gender, with linguistic and cultural and ethnic and religious differences. These have become defining features of today's classrooms, and so moving it to the center um, was something we felt was important. That would mean that our literacy practices um, also move from a more westernized perspective and they cross social, cultural and linguistic borders in how they're conceptualized and designed. And you can see from that picture there that we're not only focused on the what the norms of our context are or the, the, the exam system that our context um, requires us to attend to, but that our literacy practices engage other literacies. They engage literacies from across linguistic borders, um, across cultural borders, and these in turn reshape how we engage with the, the practices that we are so accustomed to within the UK context. In terms of professional development, some of the other key insights and recommendations we had were that there was a need for um, professional development programs and opportunities for teacher educators. And they themselves spoke of this, um, the need to extend their own practice because they had felt that it had been many years since they had taken, uh, been a part of classrooms um, and schools as they are now. And so they needed to upskill their own understandings of how to address difference. Um, a key challenge linked to that, however, as we all met together from uh, those involved in teacher education from the different contexts was finding mechanisms of this mutual sharing and that was important how we create these spaces between universities and providers and schools and also the student teachers so that a national program of development is needed. Um, that would then allow us in terms of how we're thinking about practice to engage in hybridity where you're bringing together different um, ways of thinking about practice different subject areas where we reshape through a transdisciplinary lens how we think about our own subject area or subject areas that we're teaching, whether it's science or maths or um, social studies. But being careful as we do that to start with difference as the norm. We also looked at language in the sense that a more functional approach, as Jean has mentioned, the problem-solving approaches to language, they would allow teacher educators and student teachers to gain insights into how language gets recruited on site. Um, and that's, if we looked at those pictures back, language does get recruited on site in particular ways in text, 
And those are the things that we see every day in our, our, the way that we live and how we function in society. And so a functional approach helps to contextualize that and look at the way that language is used in order to create specific meanings. And that was applicable across all subject areas. Not all um, student teachers were able to engage with EAL context in schools. And so we had thought of digital classrooms that would allow a vicarious experience for those that were not getting that um, opportunity to engage with EAL or EAL learners. And this would allow observation of a range of teachers and pupils, pupils also across the world, but also across the UK. And we thought that this was an important um, fact or recommendation and insight that we could gain. This is our, um, the end of our um, presentation, but those are our presentation contacts if you wanted to get in touch with us to discuss anything from, from Thank the you Thank you very much. And Alan, excellent. Loads of food for thought, so I can imagine the questions coming thick and fast, and we haven't got a lot of time left. So can I encourage our audience, if you have any questions, to start typing now. Thank you. <laughs> there doesn't seem to be much typing. While people start thinking and typing, I just want to, oh yes, no questions, very, very clear. Thank you, Yvonne and Jean once again. And Moira wanted to congratulate Jean as well for the wonderful third edition of your book. Um, and she says she's just looking <laughs> for all her, her programs. Yeah. yeah, thanks, Moira. Thank you. Moira. Okay. Uh, there are some lovely to hear from you. Typing. So some, some questions will be coming right now. Um, in the meantime, Yvonne, you talked about literacy that travel. Can you tell us a little bit more about that, please? Yeah, um, I think <laughs> a lot of our um, the student teachers and the teacher educators and also mainstream teachers that we've spoken to have talked about um, students struggling with cultural access to text and how that in, impacted on their comprehension. And so literacies that travel don't start with an understanding that our Western concepts of literacy and our cultural assumptions will all be understood, but they cross cultural borders and they provide a space um, where we explore the, either the power that are behind some text. So if you took those pictures, for example, that would be a text that might face a student in society. And so helping them to unpack the cultural nuance, the cultural understanding of how language is used, what shapes that, but then also to be able to deconstruct it, but to reconstruct it in a way that said, what other voices would you give? And the, the range of cultural interpretations around that would enhance literacy practices beyond the Western mindset of how we see the world. It would bring difference into the classroom. Thank you. There's a question from Nicolette here. She says, I was wondering about the teachers feeling unprepared or struggling discourse, which is coming up very strongly in other countries too. And she says, or asks rather, isn't any student teachers have the experience of being multilingual? Probably talking about, yeah, tapping into that experience. I don't know what you make of that and who would like to answer that. Um, well, shall I say something about that? I think that um, it's to do often with um, understanding your your the knowledge and experience that you bring, um, and being confident that although you may not yourself be multilingual, uh, you do have knowledge, and you know we all live in a very diverse society, and so we can all understand diversity in our different ways. Um, I, I've never agreed with um, people who would say, oh, some schools are not um, multicultural and some schools are multicultural. I think every, every specific context is diverse in its own ways. Um, and it's actually important for teachers to understand how they can access diversity in their own settings. Um, one of the um, uh, slides that I showed was a quote from a teacher who was herself multilingual. And it was great how she was recognizing her own identity 
as a multilingual person being important and being confident to uh, reflect on that and to voice that. Um, and I think that that shows us, that's a demonstration of the way we all as teachers need to understand our own identities and how they actually influence the ways that we work with our pupils. Um, I'm just looking at Ravinda's chat about using multilingual skills in class. That's brilliant, Ravinda. And the more you can do that, I think the, the greater your skills will develop. And you're also offering a role model for your multilingual pupils into the ways that multilingualism is a resource. Thank you, Jean. Teaching uh, as well as learning. I hope I, I pronounce this correctly. Duverke <laughs> says, what would you say is the exact knowledge about subject language? There seems to be so much for them to potentially work with. What is the core, yeah. and what are teachers' own useful theories of language? Lots of questions there, so pick any, any of those you want to answer, Yvonne, please. Yeah, I'm just trying to see that on the thread. It's not um, showing up. Can you just... Um, no, there, there are many questions there. Uh, what would you, you say is the exact knowledge about subject language? There seems to be so much for them to potentially work with. What is the core, and what are teachers' own useful theories of language? I think that, um, so a lot of the student teachers that I work with talk about their own subject area, their secondary teachers, and so there are certain phrases that you might use to construct a report, or there are certain phrases you might use to conduct a scientific report that's different, again, from um, something in modern studies. And so the language that is used within these different reports is something that can be highlighted for the EAL learner to be able to help them um, understand that genre and also to look at the way the language is used within their subject. But it's also about the teacher being aware that that language may be used differently across other subjects and for the teacher themselves to be able to highlight that to the students. You know, this is not the only way that this language is used. It's used this way within a different subject area that you might come across. Um, and the second part of that question was, what was that, Sylvana? A little bit again. So, uh, there seems to be so much for them to potentially work with. What is the core, and what are teachers' own useful theories of language? Yeah. Do you want to ask, answer the second one? Are you happy to yeah, do that? Yeah, I'll, I'll make sure. Yeah, sure. Um, I think that this, this question um, really sort of points to a key idea about theory that I'm always banging on about. And, you know, um, I think if it gets across, um, can be very powerful for teachers. Theory comes from practice. It can also come from our reading and our understanding of research. But as teachers, we form our theories of practice from our own practices and reflecting on those. And so teachers' own theories are actually so important and so useful. Um, they can be informed by discussion with others. They can be informed by all kinds of things. But teachers own the theories. They're based on our beliefs and our knowledge and the values that we hold. Um, and they're not something that are imposed on us from outside. And I think. If you can hold on to that idea, it can be a very empowering one as a teacher because it gives you confidence and it gives you the means through which you can improve your own practice and you can be strong in those ways of improving practice. So that, that's, you know, when I, when I mentioned that thing about theory and practice, that's one thing we're really, you know, sort of seeing is important to, to get into resources for teacher education. Teacher education isn't like learning all about a subject. It's learning how to be a teacher. And that comes from reflection on practice, which is about developing. Um, thank you. I'm just looking down through yeah. some of the threads here. Thanks, Ravinda, for the struggle. I mean, AL, people who have been AL learners themselves often understand much more richly the struggles that AL learners can currently face in our classrooms. Um, can I go into this bit yeah. from Carolina? It's, it's just 
Yeah, that was uh, that's the last question. Want to take that one? Can I just kind of comment on that? In the meantime, yeah, yeah. Um, I think that what. No, it's just going to read it out loud. It one of the things we need. Go ahead, Jean. Okay, go on. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, okay. We've mentioned this in the talk. One of the things we need uh, for, as, for, as EL teachers is a professional career structure. We don't have one at the moment, which is why. Uh, it's why I, myself, I was an EAL teacher. And I went into teacher education because I was frustrated with the ways in which I could not develop um, as a career professional EAL teacher. Um, people find ways in which to develop, um, and often they are not in schools and classrooms because there is no clear career structure, there is no clear status in schools for EAL teachers. Um, so what you say, Carolina, is exactly right. Um, I hope it will change in the future because it needs to, uh, because we need to have the mainstream education system recognise the importance of the work that EAL teachers do and to have it given suitable status. Okay, school. thank you very much, um, Dr. Uh, Conte and uh, Foley. Uh, it's been a fascinating presentation. It's clearly touched a nerve. Uh, participants are sharing their experiences, their frustrations about the situation. So thank you very much for a very thought-provoking uh, presentation with lots of food for thought, particularly for teacher educators with very useful and relevant recommendations and crucial implications really for supporting student teachers as they learn to teach diverse multilingual classes. So I'm going to round up now. Thanks again to you both. And before I close this webinar, I just wanted to remind everybody that you will get an email tomorrow with a link uh, to the video recording of this webinar, the slides and the survey. And just to let you know that we're going to be taking a break during the summer, but we are back in September with our webinar series. And our work next webinar is on Thursday, the 19th of September at 4 o'clock. And it will be presented by HMI Mark Sims from Ofsted. And he will be speaking to us about Ofsted's new education inspection framework for 2019 and its implications for schools um, regarding uh, inspecting provision for pupils with English as an additional language. So hope you can join us then. Thank you all very much for taking part in this webinar, and thanks very much again, Yvonne and Jean, for giving us your time and your expertise and sharing key findings of your research with us. So thanks and goodbye, and I'm going to end the meeting now. Thank you. Thank you.